Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the sixth episode of the Scaling Rails screencast series supported by New Relic. New Relic has an RPM service, and RPM Lite is a free, fully supported version that you and your whole team can use for an unlimited time and unlimited number of hosts to monitor your Rails performance. So if you haven't checked it out, now's the time. By the end of this episode, you'll know how to do action caching. But before we get into that, we need to discuss caching storage in Rails. Page caching is always stored on disk, unless you monkey patch Rails to do something different. While action fragment caching, which we're going to be talking about in this episode and next episode, use the configured cache that you configure in your Rails instance. You've got several different storage options for action and fragment caching, starting with memory store, which is the default option. Then you've got synchronized memory store, which is good if you're running Rails like multi-threaded, so only one can access the store at a time. Then you've got file store, so you can say you want your action and fragment caching to happen on file, just like your page caching. DRB store, memcache store, which we'll show you in a later episode. And you can also configure, you know, your host for the memcache store and send in parameters. You can also do compressed memcache store, which will gzip stuff before it puts it in memcache and then ungzip it when it comes out. And lastly, it should be stressed that it is very easy to create your own custom memory storage system in Rails. Um, so don't be intimidated by that. If you want things to work a little bit differently, just go in and do it. Make your own. So we want to do action caching, we say, when we need filters to run. Let me show you an example of how it works. So here's our stack again. Our client requests something, it goes through to our mongrel. Our mongrel is then going to take that page, store the whole page in a cache, then send it back through Apache to our client. Another request comes in, it's going to hit our mongrel, and then we have the option of running filters. A good example of this is authentication. So we can authenticate to see if the user can view this page, and if they can, well, then we grab it out of the cache and send it back to the client. So now, here we are back in our Rails application, and I'm going to add uh, some authorization. So basically, if a user wants to see this page, the post page, now they're going to have to make sure that they're uh, logged in. So I'm going to define an authenticate function, do a log method here to make sure it gets called. And then I'm going to say, if not logged in, um, redirect the user to the login path. Makes sense. So if I save this, and go back to my browser, do a refresh. It um, doesn't work yet. Oh, well, this is because we're still doing page caching. We need to, to say caches action. And then we also need to go to the public directory and delete the static post.html that got generated by our page cache, because we're no longer going to be putting stuff over there. We do a refresh. Sure enough, yay. We get our login prompt, click the login, and it shows us our page. And if we check the log down here, we can see that it cached fragment and it uh, our post method right there. So it cached the action for us. Very cool. So now if we go back to our website, oh, we're going to have to change our sweeper as well. Forgot about that. We need to say expire action instead of expire page so we can properly expire those things in our cache. So now if I change cha-cha-cha-cha to just cha-cha-cha and hit submit, I should be able to look at my log and see that, hey, the uh, fragments properly got expired there. And then down here below, they got properly regenerated. So cached fragment hit right there. And then if I scroll even further down, I can see that it actually used the fragment, didn't even call the action or the view just loaded it straight out of the cache. So as I mentioned earlier, the default cache store for both action and fragment caching out of the box is memory store. Um, the way to think about this is it's just sort of like a hash in memory. That's all it is, which is of course good until you run out of memory. Um, also, it's not shared between processes. So if you have more than one Rails instance, right, they're each going to have their in-memory caches and you get into trouble when you start trying to think about expiration because only one of them is going to expire the thing in memory and the other isn't. So what's good to use then? My recommendation is if you're just starting out with this stuff, 
is to maybe just use the file store. What's cool about the file store is you actually can go in and look at the action cache and look at the partials. But if you want to compete with the big boys, you might as well jump ahead and use memcache store. And there will actually be an episode later on where I'm going to show you how to run memcache for this type of stuff. So what type of website would be good for action caching? The first thing that comes to mind might be something like Zagat.com. What Zagat does is has lots of restaurant reviews. So they've got these articles. And in order to view the articles, you have to subscribe. You have to be a member, right? So most people viewing these reviews are all going to be seeing the same thing, but we need to make sure they're authorized. So action caching might be good for something like this. Um, at first glance, I saw uh, Google Groups has something like this, where you can't view the group's content until you're a member and you can join. So that kind of makes sense that you know everyone's going to see the same content, but they have to be authorized to see that content. So we should be able to use action caching. However, then I see this up at the uh, top of the screen, which is uh, welcome Greg, right? You've got your user credentials up there. So can you still use action caching with this sort of thing? And actually, you can. There was something that was added recently to Rails, which allows you to cache the action without the layout, right? And odds are that top right hand part of the screen where you have log in, log out is going to be part of your layout. So for this code here, it's going to render the layout on each request, which might include, you know, gregpollock at gmail.com. However, one thing to keep in mind here is that it's not going to run any part of what's inside the action inside your controller. So if you need access to, say, the particular user that's viewing this page, well, you might want to have a before filter like this where you find the user, store it in an instance variable, so your layout has access to it. Another useful feature of action caching is the ability to have conditional action caching. So for instance, you could have caches action index show and then put an if statement inside of a proc. Where would this be useful? Well, maybe you want to disable the cache on certain requests. So you would have something that looks like this, right? So if this returns false, it's not going to pull from the action cache at all. So if I go to this URL, well, it's going to bypass the action cache altogether and load the page every time. So now we know how to do action caching, but let's go over again when we might want to consider doing action caching. Well, when you can't use page caching, because you probably have code that needs to execute on every view, this could be authentication or some other piece of code, and the resulting content is always going to be the same. Well, that's all I have for episode 6 of Scaling Rails. Stay tuned for the next episode where we'll be looking at fragment caching. Thanks for watching. See you later.